So I'll begin with an apology. I didn't ask for a motion to convene in the closed session, so I'm not sure that I can move that we rise and report from closed session, but uh, maybe there'll be a nod and a wink and we'll, we'll do that momentarily. I will call us to order. It's uh, it's 5.30 and uh, ask for a motion that we do uh, rise and report from closed session then. Uh, Trustee Davies, would you do that? With honor, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. All in favor? Okay. We acknowledge that we are here on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. <laughs> we are grateful to the Mississaugas as the caretakers of this land and recognize the benefits we receive from it as we live, work, and play. We also acknowledge and give thanks to the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples who have walked before us. This land continues to be home for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, many of whom are students and workers in field schools. We are treaty people. Treaty 13A is a promise to protect and share the land. As we all benefit, we must remember that we borrow land from future generations. I ask now for an approval of the agenda. Trustee Lawton, will you do that, please? I will, Chair Crocker. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor of the agenda? Thank you. That's approved. Uh, is there anybody who will declare a conflict of interest? Seeing none. Uh, I'll apologize to any members of the public who may be here. I'm, I'm hopeful that there may be some of the new trustees here. My, I can't get my camera to work. Uh, but I do look more or less like the picture on your screen. Um, number seven on the agenda is uh, minutes for approval. First of all, 7.1, the Student Transportation Appeal Region minutes of June 24th, 2022. Um, who, who's going to speak to that? Maybe nobody needs to. Are there any questions about the minutes? No, okay. Um, uh, tr Trustee Cameron, would you move receipt of the staff for minutes then, please? I will, Chair, yes. Thank you. All in favor? That's approved. And Fiscal Planning, Finance, and Building Committee meeting of September 7th. Are there any questions from trustees about the minutes from the last meeting? I see none. Trustee Lawton, would you move receipt of that? I will. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Um, number eight on the agenda is a delegation by Andrea Nowak regarding transportation for extended French students in secondary school. Ms. Nowak, are you here? Yes, I am. Just turning on my camera. And I apologize again that I've been unable to do that. Okay. That seems rude. I apologize. No. It's so we're we're ready when you are, and 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 we'll we'll uh, listen to you for ten minutes on on my account. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. I'm the time people. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm I've kind of prepared something, and I'm just going to read it. But if you guys have any questions, if you guys could just save it to the end, and then I'll I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, but um. And I apologize if I don't word this just correctly. Um, this is my first time doing this. So, but uh, dear president of the board, members of the board and guests, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak today at the Peel District School Board meeting. My name is Andrea Novak and I'm just a member of the public. And I wanted to talk to you today about the extended French program. It was my understanding that extended French at the high school level is a privilege and everyone has access to the program. However, I've come to learn that this means that a spot will be reserved for everyone who is eligible. However, access does not include transportation. Therefore, unless you can afford to pay for private transportation, the program truly isn't accessible to everyone. We enrolled our son in an extended French program at B.D. Fleming Senior Public School as he was very interested in learning French. And we knew as the second official language in Canada, speaking French could open a lot of doors for him in the future. 
My son has done very well in the program and he really wants to continue with it, the extended French education throughout his entire high school career. However, we run into some major issues. First of all, we were notified three weeks before school started through a little sentence in a welcome letter email <laughs> I almost missed that busing would not be provided for the extended French or IB students um, at all. Right. Um, we knew that there was no extended French program within our home school, which would have been David Suzuki, which is within our assigned school boundary. So my son, we knew would have to go to Turner Fenton, which would be the cl closest school, which is across town and outside of our school boundary. However, we were never notified that transportation would not be provided if he had to go to Tur Turner Fenton. So now, last minute, we're scrambling to try and fix the problem and trying to figure out how to get him to and from school this school year. So I started digging into it and trying to find out how transportation works within the region. And I found out that transportation is only provided to students who are in their assigned school boundaries if their home school is more than 3.8 kilometers from their home. However, if a child has to go outside their school boundaries because the program that they want, right, um, is not offered at their home school, they're not provided busing, even if they live more than 3.8 kilometers away. The reason is busing is calculated from the child's home to their home school, okay? even though the school will never, the child will never ever attend that school. Instead of actually calculating the distance from a child's home to the school that they will actually be attending, right? My son, if he were to go to his home school, we would have zero issues with transportation. He would be able to get to and from no problem. However, extended French is not offered there. So what I don't understand is why the Peel District School Board calculates busing to a school that he will never attend. I just don't understand that. Also, another problem that we ran across is my son is 7.8 kilometers away from Turner Fenton. And our son is unable, right, to walk, or sorry, and our son is unable to walk to school and we found out he's not eligible for busing because it's not within our school area. So our choices are either we as parents take him to and from school every day, which isn't feasible with our current work schedules and our other children, or we have to pay for private transportation, which we can't afford. It's too expensive. I was told that courtesy busing may be available through Stop R. However, it's not guaranteed that you would get courtesy seating. However, if you're fortunate enough to get it, you're not guaranteed to keep it for the entire school year. You can get kicked off at any time. If someone in your local school, or sorry, in the local school area needs busing, their priority. So even though my son doesn't have a program in his area and has to go outside and is going a further distance, he's not considered the priority and can get kicked off of the courtesy busing. Also, courtesy busing for extended French students and IB students is not available for the first two months of school, approximately, okay? As Stop R doesn't know how many courtesy seats will be available until approximately the end of October or beginning of November. So I asked, how does a child supposed to get to and from school without courtesy busing, right, for the first two months of school, or if they get kicked off of the bus because courtesy seats are no longer available. I was told that that is a parent's responsibility. I explained, I cannot pay for transportation. I cannot take him myself. So I asked, can I temporarily remove him from the extended fringe program at Turner Fenton even though I don't want to, send him to David Suzuki until busing becomes available. 
because by law he has to go to school. I can't keep him home for two months, right? So anyway, I was told, no, that's not possible. If a child withdraws from the extended French program, they're no longer on the wait list for courtesy busing. So once again, I'm stuck. I don't know how to get my kid to and from school because I can't pay for it and I can't take them myself. And apparently there's no exceptions whatsoever to the transportation um, regulations or guidelines within Peel. Anyway, I was told the only other option that I would have is to withdraw my student, like my son, from the extended French program and send him to the local homeschool where he can take the regular grade nine French. Speaking French opens so many opportunities in the future. Our local school offering grade nine French does not provide the same level of education as the extended French program. Neither my son nor any other student in Canada should ever have to downgrade their French education in a public school because of where they live or because their parents can't afford to pay for private transportation. Extended, print, extended French should never be considered a privilege. In Canada, it should be a right and it should be truly accessible to everyone which means not only holding a spot for a student in a school, but actually making sure that the child can get to and from school. Without transportation to this program, right? It is not truly accessible to everyone, right? Um, anyway, I just, I wanted to bring it to your attention that not every child has access to the extended French programs. And I'm asking for your help to reconsider your transportation criteria for extended French program at the high school level. If children have to go outside their assigned school areas because they're not offered, certain specialized programs aren't offered at their home school. You know, then they're not truly, I apologize. Um, if they have to go outside their sign school area because their program's not offered at their home school, then I asked you to please reconsider the busing, right? Um, thank you very much. And um, if you have any questions, please, please let me know. These are very quiet. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's our, our practice to um, at, go to the questions for clarification mm -hmm. uh, from trustees, and I will ask them if they have any questions now. Uh, I don't have any questions. You were very clear. Um, I believe that Trustee McDonald and Trustee Benjamin have joined us as well. Am I right about that? Yeah, Brad McDonald's here. Yeah. Yes, and, Trustee and, Benjamin uh, also. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Susan. Um, so does anybody have a question? Uh, Trustee Sohi is also in here. Thank you. Hi, Trustee Sohi. Welcome. Do you have a question? Thank you. No, it was very clear. And uh, I think um, that's a problem that I'm hearing a lot in my wards as well. And uh, yeah, thank you. I know I spoke okay, a lot about out. my son. Sorry, I know I spoke a lot about my son, but it's not just about my son. It's it's like the other trustee had just mentioned. It's about all students that want to go to specialized programs that are not offered at their home school. So please don't think it's just my son. I gave you an example of what we've been going through, but it really does apply to everyone. And I really I hope that the board can get back to me and hopefully we can come to some type of resolution so that everyone's entitled to the same education. Thank opportunities. You, Andrea. You're Thank you. never wrong for advocating for your child, and, and certainly we understand that when you do that, you're advocating for others as well. And I do thank you for that. It's an operational question. Um, it's not one that I can answer tonight or should answer tonight. 
Um, Associate Director Gill, who can I tell Andrea will get back to her with an answer? Um, normally we, we would do that, Andrea, before the next meeting of, uh, of this committee. So through you, uh, uh, Chair Crocker, we will uh, we will review the delegation and and based on that we will uh, respond to the to the delegate. OK, so Andrew, you will hear from the director's office then. And and if you don't, uh, obviously you've contacted them in the first place, so you know how to follow up, but I'm sure you will. They're they're diligent. Thank you very much. OK, Trustee Soe, would you move receipt of uh, the delegation? Please? Yes, yes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. It's, re it's received. OK, thank you. Um, Andrea, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. It's a uh, it's a, an open public meeting. The choice is yours. Thank you very much. Take care. You too. Uh, staff reports 9.1 is the annual planning document. I'll turn to you, Mr. Wright. Uh, thank you, Chair Crocker. It's it's my good fortune this evening to make the inter introductory remarks for the board's 22-23 annual planning document, what we common what is commonly known as the APD. Uh, in brief, the APD is the board's major capital planning document, and includes recommendations, of course, for board approval, for new schools, additions. Uh, additions would increase of capacity in particular and proposed school boundary changes. The presentation of this year's APD is the result of what has been an almost year long collaborative process, something the board has done for over 36 years. Our collaboration this year has involved discussions and the development of draft recommendations in consultation with the affected principals, superintendents of schools, and trustees. In addition to the APD's recommendations, which we will be presenting shortly, the APD also includes, most importantly, our 10-year enrollment projections upon which our, our capital plan is based. If I may, Mr. Chair, I'd like to introduce the both Alex Blaker and Jules Wagel, members of the planning department team who will present our enrollments and they will be accompanied by Suzanne Blakeman and Dana Kateris who will speak to the recommendations I've already referred to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wright. So we'll hear the rest of the report. Thank you. You're welcome. Alex, if you're there. Yeah, if we could just advance the slide, that would be great. Okay. So I'm not sure who's speaking to this slide, actually. Um, the one, OK, let's advance the slide again then. And one more, Alex. OK, yeah, so we've gone through these as well. OK, here we are. Um, so elementary enrollment trends. Uh, so this graph illustrates the 10-year uh, enrollment projections for capital planning purposes, and it breaks it down also by municipality. First off, I, I'd like to say that I think this uh, graph best illustrates the impact the pandemic has had on elementary enrollments. If you look over the past three years, that big drop in overall elementary enrollments, um, it, it's actually over 7,000 students since before uh, the pandemic. You'll also notice going forward, we do anticipate some form of turnaround in order to derive this capital plan. Uh, what that looks like uh, will probably be a, a stabilization. I'd like to point out that these projections you're seeing are not necessarily what the schools will be staffed on. These projections are for capital planning um, purposes. And the, the level of growth is such that we want to get ahead of the development when we declare which years uh, our schools are, are pegged in. You'll notice that going forward, Caledon is really the primary of driver of growth um, for the next several years. Uh, Brampton has some areas of declining enrollment now, as does Mississauga. So the areas of growth in Brampton kind of just level off the, the areas of decline like uh, Springdale and um, Castlebrook area. So 
Uh, Caledon with Mayfield West uh, at the bottom is really what we're looking at for, for major area of growth going forward. Um, there are a few reasons for the for the decline over the last few years that I think Julian will uh, be able to illustrate better, so I won't go into into those. Uh, however, if we move on to the secondary uh, slide, um, this looks a, quite a bit different than elementary. Um, so our uh, secondary enrollments have been actually pretty stable during the the pandemic, and that's because we've enjoyed some pretty large grade eight cohorts coming into the secondary panel over the last several years. However, with the pandemic really uh, impacting our elementary enrollments, uh, we are going to see reduced grade eight cohorts going into the secondary panel. Uh, so that's why you're seeing decline on that top line that at, it shows the board total. So it is a few years of decline likely at the secondary panel. So uh, I think we ought to be uh, prepared for that going forward. Again, Caledon is the only area where we do see a little bit of overall growth in the uh, secondary panel. I think with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Julian, who, uh, who can maybe describe some of the interesting trends we saw over the, the pandemic. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Alex. Can we just go to the next slide, please? Perfect. So as Alex mentioned, we did see some decline over during the uh, pandemic. So the graph in front of you uh, shows the number of new registrations to the board um, from June to September since 2010. You also notice um, from 2014 onward, uh, the graph also shows the number of new students that have arrived at the board from outside the province of Ontario. <clears throat> That's the hatch lines right down at the bottom of, of the graphs. Pre-pandemic, the board was averaging a about 17,700 new registrations from June to September, including approximately 2,800 registrations from outside uh, the province. The, the, pande the pandemic saw uh, borders close and immigration drop significantly. In the year 2020, uh, this resulted in just over 14,000 new, re new registrations, which was well uh, below average and one of the reasons the board experienced a uh, drop in enrollment. However, as we moved out of, out of the uh, pandemic and uh, the last line on the graph for year uh, 2022, uh, we've ex experienced a return to near normal levels of new uh, registrations from outside the province. And overall, new registrations from June to September are once again uh, close to average. Next slide, please. So while we gain a significant number of students each year, the board also has a large number of withdrawals uh, from June to September. So th this graph is showing student withdrawals for kindergarten to grade 11 from June to September since 2010. Uh, during the pandemic, many GTA boards, including uh, um, PDSB, experienced numerous families moving to areas uh, uh, of, of the province where more affordable housing options were available, this, such as uh, London and um, Simcoe County. Before the pandemic, there was an average of 8,800 withdrawals per year, but during the pandemic, the board saw a peak of 11,000 students leave the board uh, during the summer of uh, 2021. And this past summer, we have continued to see uh, above average numbers of students um, leaving the board. Going forward, staff will continue to monitor the movement of students into and out of the board and the resulting impact of um, uh, long term impacts on um, uh, projections. Next slide, please. Uh, the recommendations contained in this year's APD are for construction of one new school and two additions and for five boundary changes. Next slide, please. Mount Pleasant number five, K-8, 850 Pupil Place School that will accommodate enrollment growth in the Mount Pleasant community in Brampton is projected to be required for student occupancy in 2025. Because uh, the ministry and municipal approval processes and construction timelines are lengthy, we seek board approval for new schools several years before they're required. This new school is being recommended because the board has previously approved all other schools required in 2025 or earlier. Next slide, please. 
Additions of eight to 10 classrooms are being recommended at both Tony, Tony Pontes in Caledon and Elm Drive Public School in Mississauga. The 650 people place capacity of these schools has proven to be insufficient to accommodate the enrollment growth coming from the Mayfield West community in the case of Tony Pontes and from City Centre for the newly opened Elm Drive. Additions at these schools will increase their approximate capacities to the 850 pupil places that was originally requested from the ministry as part of the capital priorities funding approval program. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you through the next um, recommendation, which is the five boundary changes. These will be recommendations 3A to E. It's important to note that um, all these boundary changes, the areas that are affected are areas of future development. So no existing students are affected by the boundary changes. We are also recommending that the boundaries be effective December 1st, 2022, um, which is the day after the annual planning document recommendations will go to the board for approval. This is to ensure that the boundary changes are in place prior to um, students moving into these er these affected areas. Next slide, please. So the first boundary change that I'm going to go through is a boundary change for Mount Pleasant Village Public School, James Potter Public School and McClure Public School. Mount Pleasant Village Public School is located on a very small um, site which has significant limitations for portables. We are not able to place any portables at this school. So when we look at the projected enrollment from the hatched area that you can see there um, on the map, the red where the red lines are, we are projecting that more students are going to come from this area than what Mount Pleasant would be able to accommodate. So because of this, we are recommending that K to five students from this area be redirected to James Potter Public School and grade six to eight students be directed to McClure Public School. Again, there are no existing students from any of the schools mentioned that would be affected by the boundary change, and this would be for December 1st, 2022. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this boundary change recommendation 3B is for a boundary change between Jean Augustine and David Suzuki secondary schools. And this is essentially to align the elementary boundaries with the secondary boundaries. This would ensure that students who graduate from McClure in grade eight continue on with their friends to David Suzuki and are not split between the two high schools. Again, effective December 1st and no students are affected. Recommend uh, uh, next slide, please. The recommendation 3C is a boundary change between Somerset Drive and Terry Fox Public School. Somerset Drive, much like uh, Mount Pleasant Village, is located on a site with significant site limitations that do not allow us to place any portables there. Somerset is also the majority of Somerset's boundary is also built out. However, the hatched area at the top um, is an area of new development and based on enrollment projections, the school will not be able to accommodate the number of students that are expected from that development. Because of this, we are recommending these students be directed to Terry Fox where they have uh, they have the ability to accommodate the enrollment growth. Uh, next slide. Recommendation 3D is a recommended boundary change between Malala Yousafzai Public School, Brisdale Public School, and McCrimmon Middle School. So Malala, um, Malala Yousafzai Public School is currently holding at the former Aloha Public School. Um, this school we know will open quite full when, um, uh, when it is scheduled to open in the fall of 2023. The hatched area in the northwest corner of Malala's boundary is an area of new um, new development, and we know that um, Malala will not be able to accommodate these additional students. So these students we are recommending are going we are recommending that they be directed to Brisdale for kindergarten to grade five and McCrimmon Middle School for grade six to eight. What's important to note too is that um, Mount Pleasant number nine will also be um, 
coming online in hopefully September of 2024. We are going to be looking at developing a boundary for Mount Pleasant number nine through next year's annual planning document process. And at that time, we will we will be reviewing whether the hatched area can be accommodated out Mount Pleasant nine. So it's important to note that we will be taking that into consideration at that time too. So again, there are no um, students currently affected by this boundary. This is an area of future development and it will be effective September or December 1st of 2022. Um, next slide, please. So the final boundary change re recommendation, excuse me, sorry, 3E, is a boundary change between Countryside Village Public School, Houston Public School, and Larkspur Public School, as well as Sunnyview Middle School. Countryside Villages, um, for a, for a number of years was development was slow to progress um, in the boundary, but recently has come online quite quickly. And based on the um, projected enrollment growth in this boundary, the school will not be able to accommodate um, the two areas that we are recommending be directed to schools south of um, Countryside Drive. So what we are recommending is that the pink red hatched area at the top part of the map there be directed to Houston Public School for grades kindergarten to five and Sunnyview Middle School for grades six to eight and the green hatched area at the bottom there be directed to Larkspur for kindergarten to grade five and Sunnyview Middle School for grades six to eight. Both Houston, Larkspur and Sunnyview um, have the ability to accommodate the um, enrollment growth that is projected from these areas. This will also keep countryside villages from um, having to uh, have an enrollment cap in future years. Again, no students are effective, affected, sorry, and it would be um, as of December 1st. Next slide. Uh, Suzanne, I think was were you speaking to this slide or am I? No, it's me. Sorry. OK, sorry. I was on mute. Uh, recommendations aren't the only good thing in the APD. There's also a ton of great resource info like enrollment projections, French immersion program info, enrollment caps, location and timing of development, proposed joint use projects info and much more all waiting for your reading pleasure. Next slide, please. So next uh, for the annual plan document recommendations, uh, they will go to the regular meeting of the board on November 30th in a few weeks. And on behalf of the planning department, we thank you for your time and attention tonight. So thank you, Mr. Wright and, and all your staff. APD is always exciting to see. Um, I'm sure there are some questions from trustees. Is there anybody who does have a question? There's a hand up. I'm not sure who it is. It's my hand there, uh, Chair. Brad McDonald. Trustee McDonald. Yeah. There uh, you are. I have a, yeah. Thanks. I have a question through you. Uh, you know, the new school that you you talked about of uh, being set for 2025. I mean, that doesn't mean we're actually getting the new school or can proceed with the new school. This is just a process to go then ask the government to request the approval for them to give us the money for the new school, if I'm correct. The you, Chair Crocker, it's uh, Randy Wright, controller speaking. That would be correct. Uh, this would be what allows us to go forward and request capital funding for this project. So um, looking back at the last couple of years and your requests, um, how long do you think this is going to take? You know, though we need it for 2025, do you think we'll get the funding in time to open the school in 2025? I regret to say that our request for cap or the timing of our request for capital funding on the lar on on the large have not uh, corresponded with what the ministry has approved. I regret saying that. Uh, I wish I could be more optimistic about about that, but the funding model itself is. What I refer to commonly is a just-in-time 
model. It's not a model that allows, it's not a funding model that allows schools to be built and then the board or students to grow into. It's a case where the board has to prove that the students are virtually on the ground, uh, accommodated at other locations, often in portables. Uh, it's not something that planning advocates, but it is an outcome of the capital funding model. Yes. Thank you, uh, uh, controller. Right, and and then I guess that also relates to Elm Drive as well. The addition there that uh, we have to have portables and all the kids going there before we can actually have a school, you know, built uh, accommodating them. Yeah, uh, so you, uh, Chair Crocker, would agree entirely. Uh, I know it was said, but we asked for an 850 school, appreciating we had a site at the very least. And certainly as many as 27 towers would easily fill that school eventually. Uh, there's no question. And likewise, Tony Pontus, uh, if there's some frustration in my response, I do not apologize. Uh, we had asked for 850 at Tony Pontus. We had asked for 850 at Elm Drive. And it gives us no great pleasure uh, to go back and tell, tell the ministry we told you so. But the numbers are now supporting these additions and we intend to pursue it. Yeah, and uh, th through you, Chair, I'll, uh, I'll make a comment and support uh, control rights. Uh, you know, comments. I, I, you know, I think we all are frustrated, and it and it costs the government more to add an addition. Would have been is so much more expensive than if we just would have built the the school the way it was for 850, as you said. So, mm -hmm. totally in agreement with you, and I just wish the uh, government would understand that a growing board uh, that needs to accommodate kids. We can't, uh, you know. Uh, do this uh, economically and for the education of our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McDonald, for the question, which needed to be asked, and uh, Mr. Wright, for your uh, forthrightness. Uh, I think the general public needs to know more about this. It's a shame they, they probably don't. Uh, Trustee Cameron has a question, I believe. Thank you, uh, Chair Crocker. I, I would say um, moving forward uh, for the next four a uh, term of four years for the next board of trustees that uh, they might want to take a position of advocating a change in uh, that model that we're 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 struggling uh, with, which is a little backwards. Um, we have to prove maximum accommodation pressures before we can uh, get attention for new facility, new school, new addition. Um, I, and I do recall uh, the moments controller right when uh, we were celebrating what we thought was going to be 850 pupil places at Tony Pontes, um, only to have that uh, changed to six less than 650. Um, and I, it's my community and I know how much they love the uh, balanced calendar school. And perhaps you knew they were going to love it too um, back then, but it is, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's very, unfortunate now that we're asking for more space when we knew we would need it you knew we would need it that's that's your area of expertise in terms of projections so i appreciate that then i appreciate it now i'm, I'm just uh, frustrated by it now as well and I, i'd like to think about ways to uh, advocate a little a little bit on behalf of planning department moving forward I, my question through you chair is um uh, with respect to mayfield secondary school um i see that in um 2030 it looks like then a next mayfield west phase two secondary school in caledon would be projected as needed um having seen uh what's happening in mayfield west phase two area right now i i actually don't know if that's in mayfield secondary school boundary and if it isn't um where where did you think students were going to go as those houses are coming out of the ground now? Were they, are they coming to Mayfield or are they going to south to a secondary school in Brampton? Dana, can you, Dana or Alex, can you comment on that? Uh, I can try and comment through you, uh, um, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, the uh, the projections you referenced do show uh, Mayfield Secondary School going through the roof, and Mayfield West Secondary School is in fact in Mayfield's boundary. Um, 
the uh, the challenge going forward in terms of timing of the secondary schools is we know there's going to be a significant gap in when we can offer and deliver those secondary schools. So it, it could very well be that for a time, um, those Mayfield West secondary students could go to a school in Brampton, but ultimately, ultimately we do see them landing at that Mayfield West secondary school. And, and keep in mind that through the capital priority process, uh, the order of our schools can change as we look at numbers. So those timings and dates that you see in the um, capital plan, uh, it aren't set in stone. Uh, thank you through you, Chair. That That's um, very comforting to hear that the walls are a little flexible on those numbers and those projections, because I, I do think what, what and, and, you know, I would tell you that it's massive development in Mayfield West Phase 2 for a Caledon area. Like it's, it's, it really is quite stunning as I drive by there to see what's happening every day um, and wondering to myself, where, where, are, where are these children going to school? Um, and um, I think I think it would be important um, for I'm, I'm happy to be able to share with um, uh, people who move into Mayfield West, too, and maybe through their realtors uh, that um, should they should they purchase there and have secondary school students in their family, it's not guaranteed that they're going to go to what they may have thought was their school of choice. Uh, they may be going to be redirected because of space limitations at the moment. Um, you would know that I would be getting those calls from people who buy a place only to be told, no, no, you, you, you may have thought you were going here, but but you're not, or maybe you were told you were going there by the uh, real estate folks, but you're not. Um, um, 2030 seems very far out. I, I know that's um, eight years from now, um, maybe a little less than eight full years, but um, I, I see the development happening fast. So, so I appreciate, um, Alex, that, that uh, the numbers are not set in stone and that we, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on all of those. Um, I feel the same way about Caledon East Public School, by the way. A brand new school um, uh, has been approved um, and we are waiting for approval to proceed. And I know through your department, you are working on all of the paperwork that's required by the ministry to, to get that APD. But the development there is also, you know, 668 homes starting to come out of the ground, right, literally right across the street from uh, a little school that's already over capacity and, and only has 254 MRC, uh, not counting, uh, limited portable space that they have. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to keep an eye on all of those numbers and um, watch the growth take place um, in Caledon. And I appreciate uh, your help always, all of you in planning. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cameron. Are there any other questions from trustees? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Wright. Um, and with the understanding that this goes to the full board for approval in uh, a month's time or so, um, we'll uh, ask for a motion to receive. Uh, Trustee Cameron, would you make such a motion, please? And absolutely, I will, Chair. Yes. All in favor? Thank you. We are in receipt. Uh, back to you, Mr. Wright, for a good news story on Thomas Street Middle School. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The open session report on tenders tonight recommends the board approve the award of the contract for the construction of the uh, Thomas Street Middle School edition comprised of six new classrooms to Orion Construction and Management Company Limited in the amount of $4,503,841 including a HST uh, having reviewed the low bid. In fact, having reviewed all the bids, I'm happy to report that this is a competitive price. Uh, the company comes to us with a satisfactory performance record. And again, we recommend the award of this project to Orient Construction Limited. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Are there any questions? about the Thomas Street edition. As I said in closed session, uh, this will be transformational for the school. It's uh, when you when you look at the um, at the plan, it's uh, it's impressive. So thank you. Uh, um, 
Trustee Davies, will you move uh, receipt of this report, please? Yes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. All in favor? It's received. 9.3 is the application status update. Uh, Mr. Wright? Uh, to you, uh, Chair uh, Crocker, I would ask uh, Nick Gooding, one of our planners, uh, to speak to this particular report. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Randy you. and Chair Crocker. Thank you both. Um, this report is for information. Uh, it includes a list of development, residential development applications reviewed by staff in the months of August and September of 2022. Also included in the report are location maps provided by our enrollment department and letters sent to the respective municipalities as well. Uh, with respect to the listed applications, you see the anticipated number of students that will be generated were either included in previous projections and sufficient school accommodation is in place or will be provided by new schools appro approved by the board's annual planning document. Uh, pupil yield factors are generated by matching student addresses from the board student information systems with housing typology data received from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. And a unique yield factor is generated for each community by housing type, which is used to project the number of students anticipated from new developments. If anyone has any questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Gooding about the application status update? I see none. Trustee Soe, will you move re receipt? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. All in favor? This too is received. Uh, 9.4 is a tender activity report. Uh, Ms. Dobson? Thank you and good evening. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, on page 235 of your package, you will find the tender activity report for the period of August 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2022. Within this document, you will also find um, any, any tenders that were awarded, the timing of the award, the, uh, uh, sorry, the duration of the award, and also the total value of the award. Uh, on page 236, you will also find a few uh, of the contracts that have currently been extended during that time period as well. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Are there questions on the tender activity report? I see none. Uh, Trustee Cameron, would you move receipt, please? Yes, I will, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? It's received and uh, 9.5 is the vandalism activity report. Ms. Dobson again. Thank you again and through you chair. Um, the purpose of the uh, of the uh, vandalism activity report is to just provide you for the months of May 2022, June 2022 and July 22 on any vandalism that has occurred uh, at any of our sites. Um, I'm happy to, uh, it's it's on page 237 of your report, beginning on page 237, and I'm happy to take any questions on any of the vandalism activity reports. Are there questions from trustees? I see none. Uh, Trustee Davies, would you move receipt, please? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chair. Thank you, all in favor? Staff reports are all received. Thank you very much. We we move now to agenda item number 10. I'm aware of no trustee motions for consideration introduced at a previous meeting. Subject to correction. Uh, item number 11 is trustee notices of motion for discussion at the next meeting. I'm not aware of any. Um, is there anything late breaking there? Seeing none, and before we move to adjournment at the chair's discretion, since this is the last meeting of uh, this particular version of the physical planning and finance and building committee, um, I'm, I'm willing to uh, hear any brief statement that uh, trustees may may have if they would, would like to, uh, starting with Trustee Cameron. Thank you. Um, it would probably go without saying um, how much I have appreciated working with um, everyone um, 
in this department and on my uh, co with my colleagues on the team of trustees uh, for the last four years. I am um, happy for those who have made choices for themselves about what they'd like to do moving forward. Um, wish everyone only the best and um, I um, thank you for all of your uh, guidance, direction, suggestions, help and patience um, often. Um, I will miss you. I will miss each of you. Uh, thank you. And I would like to say something about the planning department, if I may, uh, through you, Chair. It, it, it never um, ceases to amaze me uh, when we see a document like an APD that is filled with information, important information for everyone in this board to have their fingers on, um, to be able to read uh, at a moment's notice. But what is incredibly wonderful about um, this is the detail and clarity that you provide. This is the second largest school board in Canada. I don't need to keep repeating that, but that's a pretty big operation. And the detail that you provide uh, through um, Associate Director Gill and Controller Wright and, and everyone um, on your team, I just wanna say thank you again for that. I deeply appreciate it, and I will deeply appreciate it for the next four years. Uh, thank you, everyone. In, enjoy your evening. Thank you, Trustee Cameron. Trustee Davies. Just want to thank the uh, physical planning and building uh, people. Uh, I've got my little notes here. Malala, fall of 2023. Mount Pleasant, fall of 2024. Thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate that. I know uh, my wards are the growing wards, and uh, so... I'm the bad guy, and I, I appreciate all your help. Thank you. You're not the bad guy, Trustee Davies. No. Uh, Trustee Lawton. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair, um, I'd like to thank everyone <clears throat> in the department. Um, there's no question that this is my favorite committee, uh, my favorite meeting, um, and has been for 12 years. It's because uh, you are, uh, you anticipate um, our needs. Uh, you are uh, very, uh, very attuned to our communities uh, most of the time uh, and, uh, and know what we're going to need. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you and uh, certainly will miss working with you. Thank you for all you've done for my community over the 12 years, communities. Um, I know that uh, it hasn't always been easy, uh, but we have done some great work together and I'm very happy to, to see the additions that uh, at Glen Forest Secondary School and, and I'm, I'm sure buried in that latest APD, I know buried in that latest APD is one of my schools at least that is uh, has been mentioned. So coming from a no growth, very low growth area, um, I, uh, I again appreciate the depth that you all go to, to, to give us the best information that you have. Thank you. Chair Crocker, I'm going to stop before I start to cry. <laughs> I know just how you feel. Trustee Soy, did you uh, have anything to say? Thank you, Chair Crocker. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone in here, including the trustees. Um, I learned a lot in the last four years, specifically in this committee. I must say this is also one of my favorite where we advocate for the growing communities. Um, the private book I'm saying during my this term was an absolute honor uh, to be the trustee of that school, the new growth. And uh, I just want to say thank you, Randy, just Paul, everyone in here uh, for listening to us. And uh, thank you to all the trustees 
I know um, I will no longer be uh, bugging anyone, <laughs> anyone <laughs> uh, pursuing other things in my future, but it was wonderful to be the trustee on this committee and with all that learning and moving forward, uh, but I will miss you all. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Soe. Trustee Benjamin. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm not a member of this committee, but I try to attend as many meetings as possible because it's very educative and I learn a lot. I would like to thank all the trustee members of this committee for the wonderful work they have done, especially to trustee Crocker, trustee Sohi and trustee Lawton who are not returning. We are going to miss you. I would like to add that <clears throat> This team is very, very professional and uh, you have done a wonderful job. And somebody mentioned about uh, the new developments taking place and how exciting it is. But I would also like to add that I come from a ward which is one of the oldest maybe areas in the PDSB. And yet exciting things can happen. So we have the Malton, uh, you know, the track coming up in Lincoln Alexander and the Malton Youth Hub. So that is very, very exciting. And I would like to thank uh, the board for all the uh, you know support they have given in making this uh, happen. And so thank you very much. And I look forward to working in the next four years with this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Benjamin. Trustee Brad McDonald. You're muted, Brad. Thank you. I took my camera, but not my mic, but uh, thank you. Uh, uh, through you, Chair, I'll, I'll continue the uh, sentiments to uh, great staff and our trustees. Uh, it was 19 years ago uh, around this day that uh, you know I attended my first uh, meeting uh, to hear about the annual, annual planning document. Uh, back then, the growth was incredible. Uh, and it was also involving uh, Mrs. Saga at the time, Churchill Meadows, and, and even made it to my to my ward. So uh, it, it was a very important uh, uh, committee to join, in, and uh, that's where I, I got to meet uh, Randy and all the great people that we have, uh, ensuring that we have and do the best we can with government's restrictions to provide accommodations uh, and uh, as well as uh, you know, renovations and all kinds of things, and including the boundary changes, which can be challenging at times um, when we have to move uh, kids and our great children around to accommodate enrollment pressures. But I just can't thank our staff enough. A great job. And then finally, uh, I'll just uh, like to take this time to thank our, our trustees that are moving on. Um, You've been a, a great friends for not just myself, but our staff, but but our, our students and parents and community. You focused on their um, education and made that your goal to ensure that our community it has the best it possibly can. And and I'm really proud of, of knowing you and having the opportunity to work with you. And I wish you all the best in the, the future that you have ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McDonald. Did I catch up to all the trustees in attendance? I think I did. Um, if I may finish then, I, I too wish to thank the members of the committee and of course the staff for the cordiality, the best word I could come up with, the cordiality with, with which we've interacted over the years. Thank you for your focus on what's best for our students and the wider community. Uh, future challenges loom, and some of them quite immediate this week. Um, in a business where 50% is a passing grade, in fact, you can get away with 47, it's not so on the plant side, where, as the song says, 99.5% just won't do. And you've, and you've never been satisfied with 99.5% in planning, in the custodial part, um, and maintenance and all that work uh, it's always been better than 99 and a half 
Uh, Associate Director Gill, uh, please uh, convey the thanks of this incarnation of the PPFNB to all your staff. And with that, I will accept a motion to adjourn, uh, perhaps for my friend Sue Lawton. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Trustee Lawton. All in favor of adjournment? One last time. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>